we are yet to catch up to the global standard of professionalism. We can therefore thought of conducting a program on creating uh, professionalism in Odisha of global standard. Um, following the methods of the international uh, international methods. So we are fortunate to have two uh, members of think tank. Both are brilliant in their own area of uh, specialization. Uh, professor Dr. Unkar Mahanti and uh, uh, Professor Dr. Damodara Achachi. Both are uh, 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 icons, so, so to say, in their own area of uh, specialization. And uh, both are the um, uh, doctorate, both are the uh, um, alumni of IIT, and both are both are uh, uh, vice chancellor of Vidyapatna uh, uh, University of Technology, and uh, we are very fortunate to get both of them here. And then uh, today's uh, main speech will be of uh, Dr. Umtar Mahanti, and after. Is uh, uh, a speech. Uh, there will be an interactive session, and then uh, uh, Dr. Damodar Acharya will be uh, uh, moderator, and also he will also give the concluding remark. And uh, as we now see in a very short period, so many dignitaries have reached here, and then we, I welcome everybody, uh, uh, professors and uh, director of NISER and other players, other. Uh, all are welcome here. And uh, it is my duty to introduce great privilege, rather opportunity to introduce uh, uh, our uh, main speaker, uh, Dr. Mahanti, and then also uh, Dr. Tamadar Achach. Uh, <laughs> The B Tech and M Tech in Metallurgical Engineering at uh, uh, IIT Kharagpur, PhD from University of uh, uh, Germany. I think I have pronounced correct me if I am wrong. And then uh, uh, he did a course in Business Administration from CEDP, the International Non Profit Organization known as European Center for Education. <laughs> I think we should we should request people actually to uh, shut their microphones. Sorry. So one of you is speaking. When so this Babu is speaking, the others I think. Please, all others kindly mute yourself. Am I to again repeat the introduction or am I audible to all? Thank you. Man. Yes, you are audible. Uh, he had brilliant teaching uh, and research career. He served as a professor of IIT Kharagpur for most of his service career. Director of uh, he was the uh, direct uh, he was uh, uh, director of research and development at Tata Steel, vice chancellor of Vijayapatna University of Technology, Odisha. Besides, he had many national and international engagements. Like he was Inido consultant at Harare and Vienna. The chairman of the UK India Committee on Material Science, the Indian coordinator of Indo US project on special steels. He was, he's a, he was a member of the International Consortium on the Ultra Light Steel Auto Body, that is ULSAB and ULSAB AVC program of the International Iron and Steel Institute. And he was chairman of the Acquisition Evaluation Committee, AEC, of National Board of Acquisition, NBA. He has supervised 13 PhD uh, legislation and published over 130 original research papers and many other scholarly articles in various uh, journals and books. He holds 17 patents. And then his major contributions are Fellow of National Academy of Sciences, Vishwas Vishwasar Award of Institute of India, <coughs> India, et cetera, et cetera. And so many other accolades. That I think uh, um, I may not be able to uh, cover everything, the total projection of his profile to these few, few lines, whatever I am not able to do, that is his personality. And then uh, currently, he is the Director, Technology and Academic Initiative, RSP Metal Technology, 
arrested group Pune. I would rather request him while he's deliberating speech, kindly elaborate your, his present uh, engagement in RSV group. That will be better. Uh, so he can explain it better. And then welcome, sir. Welcome to this uh, uh, seminar. And then uh, as I told that uh, uh, Professor Gramodha Acharya will be the moderator and also <laughs> the concluding remark and uh, uh, and uh, it's a great privilege again to introduce him. And uh, I think everybody knows him. Dr. Damodra Acharya was an alumni of Regional College of Indian in uh, the present institute of MIT, where he did his BTEC and is the recipient of Distinguished Alumnus Award in this institute. He did MTEC in, uh, in IE, IE and OR and a PhD from IIT for that. He is the first alumni of IIT Kharagpur to become the uh, director and also the first Odia to take up such prestigious responsibility. Recently, he was also awarded the Distinguished Alumnus Award from IIT Kharagpur. He was the first Odia to serve as the chairman of All India Council of Technical Education, AICTE, from 2005 to 2007. And he was also the first Odia to be the director of Central Board of Reserve Bank of India, RBI, in 2012. He also served as the founding vice chancellor of Biju Patnaik University of Technology, Bipu, in Odisha, in Odisha between 2002 and 2005. Professor Dr. Acharya greatly contributed to the establishment of the Google campus at IIT Kharagpur and subsequently IIT Bhubaneswar and the Institute of Chemical Technology in Bhubaneswar. He is heading now the SOA International Advisory Board since 2013. He is very active in academic. Both the uh, uh, dignitaries are very active in academic and professional activities. We are very fortunate to be. Welcome, sir. And then today's uh, uh, webinar was to be presided by uh, our president, president of Think Tank, Mr. D.K. Rai. He was rather very much enthusiastic about it in spite of his ill health, chronic ill health. He suffers from uh, arthritis and uh, some sort of spondylitis. spondylitis. Now they say that he's suffering from Parkinson's. And then uh, in spite of that, he said that I will be there, in joining there in your program. But a couple of hours back, he told me that uh, uh, one month back, he had uh, taken an appointment with a, a doctor from Hyderabad to take the second opinion. And uh, today he is reaching a and he has the appointment to be him at 5.30 uh, at 6 p.m. So he is not able to be here. So uh, in his absence, rather I should request uh, Dr. Acharya to uh, preside over the um, proceedings and also moderate it and give the concluding remark. Welcome again, everybody. And then uh, I would rather say that uh, uh, everybody has to mute their uh, um, uh, fight so that there will be proper interaction. And in the, uh, after uh, Dr. Mahathi's uh, speech, uh, there will be about 25 uh, minutes of uh, interactive session, and then uh, uh, which will be moderated by Dr. Damodra Chabi, of course. And then those who want to speak, please raise their hand or indicate in the chat box so that uh, uh, they can be allowed to speak there. And please limit it to two to three minutes only because there are, there may not be any time. And then, of course, today we have got Professor Patik Misra, uh, a very eminent professor, and he will be proposing that vote of thanks. And uh, I should not take much uh, time. And now I uh, hand over the floor to Dr. Damodar Acharya uh, to preside over it and then come back. Thank you, sir. Thank you and welcome again. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Sudesh Patnaik, sir. Uh, first of all, I would like to wish a very quick recovery of our president, Mr. Dhiran Rai. Without him, think tech meeting we cannot really think of. So, therefore, I am only as a working person here. Am I, am I audible? Very much, yes. Okay, thank you. So now we will go into the our proper show. I request uh, Dr. Omkar Mohanty, Professor Omkar Mohanty, to speak. And for your information, he is at least five years senior to me. 
<laughs> he, he was a faculty when I was a student in IIT Kharagpur. So in every respect, whether it is age-wise or professionalized, he's much, much senior to me. So naturally, I, I am not the correct person to preside, but I am only doing a sort of a stop gear job. Professor <laughs> Mahathir, sir. Thank you. So let me begin by uh, wishing everybody a wonderful time, not just during my lecture, but otherwise. And I joined uh, Professor Acharya, Damodar Acharya, in wishing a victory for uh, Mr. Dhirendra. Hope he will be able to join from next meeting onwards. <clears throat> First of all, the, at the outset, uh, uh, our intellectual friends and, and a number of uh, elites from the Orishan community and probably some of my friends even from outside. And um, I have to have some apology right at the beginning, 35 minutes. And now I think the time is 5.49, 5.50. If I take 35 minutes from here, there are two slides I have to rush through. And those are inconsequential in terms of the meaning part, but they are very important to get a complete picture, which is why I have actually uh, chosen them. So I will go through them quite quickly. So basically, <clears throat> there is no Odisha context per se. Uh, if, if some of you would have cared to go through my um, abstract, I, have, I had prepared actually with some care the abstract part where I had condensed the entire uh, lecture of today, excellence in professional engineering community, the international way. The reason I want to call it uh, the international way is um, professional engineering community, education, these are subjects where everyone in Odisha or in India thinks he is an expert. Everyone, actually, the reason is we all have a view. That is true. That is also true. Everybody has a view as far as professionalism is concerned and engineering community is concerned. <clears throat> what we are trying to do over here is basically to find out, is there a way, is there one of the methods that we can choose but this may not be the only method. This is not the only or unique method. So this is uh, a kind of uh, apology if I'm calling it an international way, not just because I'm calling, uh, I'm speaking, therefore it is an international way. <clears throat> so uh, in this slide itself, if you're looking at today's world, you do find that there are, uh, there are great engineering performances around us which are taking place. I'm not able to move forward. Why? I don't know why. Uh, just, just give me, yeah. <clears throat> so the scheme of presentation, some basic questions. Why does a country need professionals? The second one is, who is a professional? And what's the process of raising excellent professionals? And uh, what are the roles of the stakeholders in society? So these are natural questions, so I put them together. But when it comes to who is a professional, I'm actually reminded of uh, the typical Indian story. Typical Indian story is when Mahanti did 50 years back, let us say political science or whatever, Sanskrit, whatever subject from Utkal University or some other university, stood fast in the university, put in bracket, university gold medalist, hang it on my gate, and that continues to be there for the next 40 years. This is what under professionalism we understand. That 50 years back, here is Onkar Mahanti who got uh, the university first position. But today's world, unfortunately, is a very harsh world, highly competitive, and they will not recognize this. <clears throat> so therefore, situation has changed. There is a paradigm shift in our understanding of the classical understanding. Uh, there may be a specific role of the government I come, back to, I come back to what I showed on the first slide. If you're talking of the high-speed uh, bullet trains in China under the uh, Chinese railway, this brand is Chinese railway high-speed, CRH. And the high-speed railway lines, HSR, uh, which goes or which moves at 250, 350 kilometers per hour, the, the astounding thing is they have close to 40,000 kilometers already with HSR lines. You look at Burj Khalifa, uh, by the way, I'm told that only a few blocks away, uh, another building is coming up, which will also overtake Burj Khalifa, which is already 2,717 feet. 
and at that height, it is the number one uh, tower in the world. <clears throat> so therefore, what is happening is, we saw the railways excellence, whatever is happening on the engineering front, and we also saw in the construction sector what's happening. And uh, in a place in Dubai, where uh, the, 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 the climate, as well as the environment and the ambience is quite harsh. So even in the midst of all that, one can see such excellence. Of course, one would say they have money, so they have spent it, not just money. Aesthetics, I'm not competent to speak about it, but people have spoken about Dubai's building aesthetics. Now, immediately after that, I wish to contrast it. I wish to contrast it with uh, the examples of some of the engineering failures in India. And let me start with my home state and hometown. <clears throat> the flyover collapse in Bhubaneswar, 2017. This was uh, near Bomikal. <clears throat> Indian Express said at least two people feared dead, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not reading it. Satya Patnaik, a poor uh, businessman, was killed as he was with his daughter, Sitel. All these came out in the newspaper. What the newspaper also reported is the scapegoats. This is another important thing. Whenever such a thing takes place, you would always find there'll be scapegoats. So one, <coughs> two engineers suspended and high level inquiry ordered, exemplary action will be taken against guilty. These are very standard uh, phrases. And that is why I thought I would also share this with you. This is very standard. There's nothing uh, spectacular about it. Anytime there is a failure, you will hear this. And it is not just our hometown, Bhubanesho. Come to Calcutta, 2016. Kolkata flyover collapse. The officials detained, they told Bridges 25, et cetera, et cetera. And this was, of course, not a very brand new one. This was a rather old one. And so many people were crossed and vehicles also were crossed and so on and so forth. I come to my own discipline, the metallurgical discipline. And RINL, we were pr pr proud of the, the um, RINL Vijak steel plant. And unfortunately, the Ever accident in the history of uh, the steel plants in India took place there in the year 2012. 16 workers, including some officers, were burnt alive. And interestingly, or sadly, this was when uh, a pra practically brand new, newly commissioned oxygen plant in the steel melting shop unit was actually being commissioned. And that's where the failure took place. Took place. Yes, we come to the steel part. Because uh, India, of course, we pride, pride ourselves with the fact that we produce 118 million tons. We are number two in the world as far as steel production is concerned. And um, India's steel production from 2020 to 2021 rose by 18%. These are good facts. But compare and contrast it with uh, the world produced 1950 million tons around that time or that year, 2021. And China, China produced about 1,100 million tons. So more than 50%, more than 55% were China's, and India was number two, but China is exactly 10 times. You look at aluminum, if India produces 24, 4 million tons, there, so there will be about 45 million tons, and so on and so forth. You go to rare earths, 96% of the rare earths are produced by China. So it's not just the railways, it is not just the highways, you'll find that China's dominance is there practically everywhere. And what is interesting is, although they started in 1954, India was better off than China when it came to modern steel making. And today, see where they are. And what is uh, astounding is, most of them are Chinese mm. technologies today, although they started copying Japanese technology and German technology right and center. But they started building their own blast furnaces. This 4,000 meter cube blast furnaces they started building. We have built, India has still not built a single 4,000 meter cube blast furnace in India as yet. Anyway, so that's not the topic, but these are extremely important items of engineering. And uh, that would actually send us thinking as to why and what should be done so that our professionals improve. That, so that brings me face to face with this question. Does India need professionals? The question is, who are professionals and why excellence? So we know that professionals that possess relevant academic background and training and experience in relevant. And more important is uh, go through a screening and qualify to be professionals. You know, the state 
Three is extremely important. We qualify to be professionals. I graduate out of uh, IIT Kharagpur degree with first class honors. That doesn't make me a professional. No, no way. Mm. In India, we accept that he has a B.Tech degree. He is a professional. No, you have to qualify, and that's what I will be talking about. And what kind of qualifications? They are defined. <laughs> And go through a regular professional updating programs and log in the proof of updating. That's very important also. <clears throat> the proof of updating the competence is something that international bodies actually recommend, and we will go through that program. Why do India or why does India need professionals? And silly because, of course, we need uh, people or engineers to provide food, shelter to its people, welfare the society per se, is the lookout of engineers. Be able to remain in a separate entity, also be able to mingle in a world forum. It's a very important thing. The world forum and also mingle together, it has to be there. And be able to face competition in business. And this, when we talk of competition, I lived in a steel city called Jamshedpur for more than 20 years. Partly at the National Metallurgical Lab and uh, partly with Tata Steel. As a matter of fact, my current company, since Sudhas Babu asked me, RSB Group is headquartered in Pune, but we have uh, we operate seven different cities, 10 different plants. In Jamshedpur, we have three plants and we produce transmission component, components of automotives. And that includes actually propeller shafts, axles, gears, gearboxes, steerings, and so on. <clears throat> and the customers are Tata Motors, Ashok Leyland, Caterpillar USA, Caterpillar India, John Deere Tractor. So these are the kinds of uh, uh, people that we are talking about customers. So they are pretty competent customers also <clears throat> who are quite finicky about uh, the kind of products and very strict about what they want. So we operate out of Jamshedpur. But what I wanted to tell you was Tata Steel cannot sell an ounce of steel in Jamshedpur, let alone in other places, unless it can face competition. <clears throat> Why? Because you can purchase today Nippon steel steel very quickly in two days' time in Jamshedpur. You can get actually POSCO steel in Jamshedpur unless you are in competition with others and that should be perceived so by the customers. If I say I produce great steels, that is not true. I'm sure Dambabu will share the same experience. First time I came to be PUT, a number of people came and saw me, and every time I heard them speak, they were talking about how great they are, what kind of great action they are all doing. I had to tell them, but I'm sorry, I, I have to hear from others about you. So similarly in business competition, that when you are producing steel, then the language of the, the product itself should speak. <clears throat> so needs to conform to international standards in products, whether it is software, whether it is hardware, we do not have today, notwithstanding the fact that we have so many software companies which are recognized, respected across the globe, we have very, very few, if any, softwares which go by our name in India. There are Indians by whose name softwares are there. Joydev Mishra, one of them <coughs> from Bhubaneswar. Be able to protect our own and others' intellectual property. It's a very important thing. India and China, People are scared to release their products to India because of the copying and we are not able to protect the IPRs of other people. We need hence professionals. When the education aspect of pedestal for professional it has to start. We cannot start only at BTEC. And this is something which we have recognized and we have realized also always. At the tertiary stable stage, we cannot say that we'll become great, great professionals unless the primary and secondary stages are there. I don't intend to go through, as I said in my apologia, that uh, the history of education in India is quite important. That is true. Third century BC itself, we had when Buddhism spread, we had education in India. We, I will not go through this because today that's not our topic. And the history of education in India also was great. 11th, the Muslims established the elementary, secondary schools. These are all known. Western education made steady advances in the country with hundreds of universities, etc. But if we go through, I, I'm just citing one or two examples here. Amartya Sen's 98th Indian Science Congress uh, lecture in Chennai. That is the time when he was actually the chancellor 
of uh, Nalanda University. So he is talking about how Nalanda is great and Nalanda was great. And then he compares them with some of the oldest universities of the world, like Oxford University, Paris University, Bologna, and Padua University. Padua is supposed to be the oldest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these these are all there. Nalanda, of course, never continued to be the university, and it had a break. So etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Oxford's, the Cambridges of the world, the Oxfords of the world. Remember, Oxford University was there when our Konara Temple was being built here. <clears throat> so many a time we are told that we are great, so great that we are the first in everything in the world. That's not true, also. In Orissa, the Pushpagiri University existed in the uh, Udagiri, Lalitgiri, Ratnagiri belt. And the Pushpagiri University existed 500 years ahead of who speaks about Pushpagiri. But I'm very glad that we have now, I think, a hostel in IIT, IIT Bhubaneswar named after Pushpagiri University. So uh, the disciples came there from all around the globe. And Pushpagiri therefore was not only teaching grammar and philosophy, how great the God only was and so on. Remember when Pushpagiri was existing, soon started all our temple building started, activities started. So therefore structural engineering and uh, civil engineering, all these must be taught there, must have been taught there. So the disciples that came from 55 countries, they must have also learned about it. I'm not going through this, whether the Charaka or Susruta, Brahmagupta or Aryavata. I want to bring to your attention the fact that Samantha Chandrasekhar in the 19th century was regarded not just an ordinary astronomer, <coughs> barefoot astronomer, which uh, in England, it was considered the best astronomer ever in the world. We have not done enough justice to Chandrasekhar as yet. We have a large number of physicists present here, I'm aware. And I'm also aware of the fact they have named their uh, auditorium as Chandrasekhar Auditorium. But we have to do a lot of things, a lot more things about Samantha Chandrasekhar, Susruta, et cetera, et cetera. I, I want to spend, because this is one of the areas in which I kept myself busy while in Jamshedpur. You would see here, <clears throat> uh, the headgear wearing gentleman has to be a Greek on my, on my left or your left. From the headgear, you can recognize. And on the right, the crown, the typical Indian prince. And so uh, when we talk of, uh, from the Punjab, the, he was vanquished by Alexander the Great. So, but on this picture, this picture actually is an artist impression. And in Tata Steel, you will find one of the pictures, uh, beautiful pictures of this. Now, it's a very interesting picture. I like it because on the platter, the, uh, the Indian king is actually offering something on the platter. As if to say, I may have lost in the battleground and you may have been my conqueror there, but I have technology on hand. And this technology is something very great. That technology was Wood's metal, W-O-O-T-J. And from the Wood's metal, the Damascus swords came, not just the tribal swords, the Damascus swords. Museums around the world carry the reputed Damascus sword all over the world. There are 87 museums in the world that carry the Damascus swords. I'm not getting into the Damascus swords picture. We did some 10 years research on Damascus swords. What is important is, this is actually taken from Scientific American, 1999, I guess. And uh, the, this picture basically is by uh, one of the American professors, who talk, very urban by name, <coughs> who talks of the mystery of Damascus source. But 10 years before this, we had uh, a professor from Stanford, uh, Oleg Sharbi by name. He is the one who got me into this field of Damascus source. Oleg Sharbi wrote an article, Damascus source revisited with a question mark. And I found what kind of metallurgy went into Damascus swords. And this was before the BC era, before the AD era. This was before Christ. And there were patterns, etc. And these patterns only uh, Verhoeven in the 1999 found out that this actually contained the tungsten carbide or tantalum carbide and chromium carbide ahead of the dendrites. You can see actually streaks of red spots here. And they are the ones that gives the pattern. That was one. And the patterns were beautiful because when you run your finger on the Damascus swords, it is all smooth. And yet they have patterns. That's the beauty. As a matter of fact, the British thought that this is a magical sword. And therefore, when Tipu Sultan was using it, they were so much obsessed with that. 
They brought a special implement from London to destroy about 60 of Tipu, Tipu Sultan's swords because they thought the, all the swords might be once again taken up by the soldiers another day. Look at what the, the, the Delhi Iron Pillar is all about. Delhi Iron Pillar, the rustless wonder that India was, this is what Professor Anantharaman wrote about. And from IIT Kanpur, Bala, Bala Subramaniam did a lot of work. Some of us also did, but Bala's work is an established work internationally to show why Delhi's iron pillar was rustless. And actually how amorphous layers, etc., are there. Again, I'm not getting into this. Suffice it to say, it is actually extremely high technology, but in the yesteryear. So the uncovering of the secret of Damascus swords, a lot of people tried. Michael Faraday, the great name, 1890 tried, unsuccessfully though. We come to our own Konarak. In the Konarak temple, the temple is all gone. We see the facade. But I don't bring it to only the facade part. Most important is from my side, it is the iron pillars here or the beams, which are very important. And secondly, I would like to draw your attention. Many of you would have seen the giraffe. I have so far discovered two giraffes, but this giraffe is known world over internationally. The second giraffe is also known. And these are the iron beams which are lying there. And these iron beams have been lying there for quite some time. I was not allowed to touch it then. What I did was I took some photographs of the top of the sides. When I came to the, the, the corners and when I looked at this photograph, something struck me. What struck me was that bamboo-like structures are protruding out of these beams. The top surface, the, all the sides are all smooth, but the bamboo-like structures are protruding out. And then it, it suggested to me that smaller pillars or smaller beams are inside there. Then some of the our own history books do not mention this. Krupa Sindhu Mishra, the great historian, one of the five Satyabadi school Pancha Sakhaj of Gopabandhu Das. He has written only three books, died at the age of 39, but these three books are sufficient to tell us that he was a great historian. India, Odisha lost him prematurely. Krupa Sindhu Mishra writes about some of these by saying, that smaller, smaller yard sticks of, of iron, they were first of all made, kept there. And then over that, they used to pour liquid steel and make the, the big beams. <clears throat> Interestingly, that there, of course, he has, he's wrong because we have established that liquid steel was not being produced here. That doesn't matter. We were producing a pesty mass and uh, that steel, we, that, that was the starting material from which we were making the steel. And we called them wrought iron by hammering them. The slag used to be taken out. What remained was the wrought iron. But interestingly, what you find here, it is a single beam inside which smaller beams were there. I started calling it a composite beam. One such paper, I two years back, I went to University of uh, London and uh, University College of London, UCL, that, that I think has the largest archaeomaterials group in the whole world. 70 professors, Dambabu 70 professors. One of them, one of the products is our own professor, Kishore Basa. I don't know whether Kishore is attending. <clears throat> so Kishore is one such product from that school. Another important product from that school also is uh, Professor uh, Srinivasan, Sarada Srinivasan, Padmasri. And Sarada happens to be the daughter of uh, Srinivasan who was once upon a time, the Atomic Energy Commission chairman. I'm so, attending, sir, Kishore. Oh, wonderful, Kishore. <laughs> Great. So you are from the same school? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And Sarada Srinivasan, I credit her with the fact that all the ancient metallurgy work in South India, she is working. We do not have a comparable work in Odisha. Who, where actually these beams were being made? Where was the beam, uh, this, the casting was going on? We do not have anything about it. Although IIT Kharagpur did uh, the ground penetrating GPR studies, geology department, we, we have discussed and we are trying to put up a project proposal. What I'm trying to tell you is this composite beams basically have imparted the crack resistance faculty or property to these beams. I repeat crack resistance. Even if some of these beams were imperfect, there are actually welding imperfections. I'm not getting into that. In spite of notwithstanding those imperfections, they were still carrying the Navagraha. Some of them were carrying the Navagraha. It is extremely important for me to also point out, many of these beams, there are 29 in number. Today, there are 32 because some of them have broken. 
but uh, the big ones are 32 uh, feet long and 11 and a half inches square. And in proportion, they're more than 12 inches. Their weight is seven tons. Compare and contrast it with Delhi Iron Pillar. Delhi Iron Pillar is 28 feet, about 6.6 .6 tons weight. And six of these are iron beams in Kunarat, they're heavier than the Delhi Iron Pillar and they are, they, are, they are longer than the Delhi Iron Pillar. I'm glad to share with you the fact that about three months back, <clears throat> I proposed a pr proposal or project proposal to National Metallurgical Lab, NML Jamshedpur and IIT Bhubaneswar. So mm -hmm. invited teams from there and we submitted this project to DST. DST has now approved, ASI has approved. So we are going to find out by special phase array technique of ultrasonic, how many smaller beams are contained in every long brain beam. So that will anyway throw some uh, important light, which are technological light. Suffice it to say at this point in time, our ancestors knew how to make composite beams and why to make composite beams. <clears throat> and not just that, if you go through the earlier times uh, economic of India, the economics and economics of India, I was surprised until the Mughal era, India was accounting for more than 20% of the GDP, the world GDP. And today it is less than 1%. So it is not true that with the Western education, we have become richer, we have become gainer and so on. It is true that we have gained new knowledge, but we have also lost a lot of old knowledge. <clears throat> so today India has a poor place. So the innovation is lacking and lack of documentation. I'm not going into the details. Why knowing doing gap? Many of us, we claim that we know this or we know that. But while doing it, the knowing doing gap is extremely important. Pride in work also is perhaps lacking. So there is a paradigm shift in education internationally. What has happened is from teaching to learning, our, uh, our schools which were there, the gurukuls which are there, they're great places of teaching. That is true. But they were mostly teaching-based learning process. But today, from teaching, we are talking of the learning-based processes. It is not enough if I teach. What is important is the people who are in front of me, are they learning or they are not? And the knowledge creation. So these are extremely important. Now, regarding the Dutch India need professionals, we have talked about it. <clears throat> but who are professionals? He has to have. I've gone through that. But we are once again going through this part here because this is the relevant portion where we say what the international community is doing about it. I had said a minute back that India needs to conform to international standards. The question now is what is knowledge then? What is professionalism we have talked about? What is knowledge then? Unfortunately, what is masqueraded normally in India is data and at the most perhaps information. On this kind of diagram, where the y-axis is increasing understanding and utility, but when you come down the y-axis, it is increasing noise. So in the data, if I read newspapers, what is happening is I go around 30 countries, I share whatever I saw there, and I am usually masqueraded as a great knowledgeable person. That is the saddest part, but that is at the most, at the most only data. If you shift it, if you shift it, and take out part of the unnecessary thing or the noise part, we reduce the data to become information. But it is still information, unless you have assimilated it. If the information is fully assimilated and it is once again refurbished and taken out for the good of the society, then only and only then can you call it knowledge. People talk of higher levels beyond knowledge. Wisdom is there, salvation is there. I'm not talking about that. What we are talking about is, when do you find data to be upgraded to information? And information must also be upgraded to knowledge by increasing understanding and utility. Then only it becomes knowledge, not otherwise. So the exam, now I come to the professionalism in the international sense. And in the international sense, in the abstract I've written, but here I will give only a few words that the examples of engineering community the engineering community, according to the International Engineering Alliance, by the way, this is a body which, is, which has its headquarters in Wellington in New Zealand. And this is the international body where most countries are members and where the 
academic part, professional, that means the training part, everything is con not controlled or regulated actually from here. So IEA provides the secretariat, et cetera, et cetera. Members of the IEA are the participating organizations in the education accords and also professional competence agreements. There are two things I'm talking about. One educational accords and the other one is professional competence agreements. Many of these terms are not even known in India, let alone go in details into that. Each member is represented by a delegation to the annual IEA meeting, et cetera. That's not important. About uh, eight years back, we had the 18 members. Today, I think there are 22 or 24 members. So Australia started in 89. Actually, most of the earlier members started in 89. India became a part of this, became 2014. Why? Because India became a part of the Washington Accord. Our NBA became a part of the Washington Accord. But apart from Washington Accord, there are many other things in IEA. We'll talk about it. So India came into the picture much later. The United States, United Kingdom, even Turkey came at least three years ahead of us. Malaysia came five years ahead of us. Korea was seven years ahead of us, etc. Et I want to talk about who are the engineering community. Engineering community, according to this international parlance, if you take the engineering trades at least three levels. One is the professional engineers. The next one is engineering technologists. And the next one is engineering technicians. In India, we loosely call them degree engineers. That is the most one. Next one is called diploma engineers. Third one is called the certificate engineers, ITI engineers. Well, I say all the time, sadly, because it's uh, the second and third, that means the engineering technicians and technologists are not yet recognized internationally. If the professional engineers, we are talking about it, and the Washington Accord is a part of that, we'll talk about it. In each of these stages, the international body has actually defined what is responsibility, which is called the range. The next one is called the knowledge of each of these levels, which is basically known as the depth and breadth of that. And the third one is the skill. The skill part has two, again, sub parts, conceptual part and practical part. And for each occupation, there is an optimal education and optimal experience. This is all defined in the mm -hmm. document. When you talk of the engineering team, the formative education part, <coughs> so four to five year binge, et cetera, that comes under the Washington Accord. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you please shut your, uh, the system? Whoever is speaking politely, I would like to say humbly. So uh, the, the point is three year, three year uh, course, which is under the accord is called the Sydney Accord. We have not even heard of that or the Indian institutions have not never applied for that. Washington Accord is the only thing which you know, which is the four year BTEC or the five year composite uh, M engineering. But so that is three year Beans Tech. As a matter of fact, the Beans Tech is governed by the Sydney Accord and then the two-year diploma or associate degrees, which is again governed by Dublin Accord. And in India, we call them the ITIs. But engineering technician practice and the, the articulation pathway shows that engineering technology practice, whether they can actually be recognized, we do not know that. I will come to that a little later. Why do I say that? Because as far as India is concerned, <clears throat> We can go through the three-year diploma, two-year higher secondary, two-year higher secondary can straight away join M engineering. They can go to the five-year M engineering, which is the postgraduate or four-year B engineering. And they can also, at the, after the class 10, they can go to a three-year diploma. The three-year diploma, you can read there, one to 10 school education. But internationally, this equivalence is not there. <clears throat> There are two key points for mutual recognition. All these international alliance that we are talking about is basically for mutual recognition. Ladies and gentlemen, this particular diagram is one of the most important diagrams which I'm trying to explain to you. The first one is the yellow part is the International Education Accords. The Washington Accord, the Sydney Accord, and the Dublin Accord. They are all education accords. And these education accords basically are the accrediting the education programs, be it four year, five year, or three year programs, or two year programs. But thereafter, at the interface here, at the interface, 
one has to after passing out they have to go through some training and hands on experience after the hands on experience they have to demonstrate the competence for independent practice this is what the international body tells us and there is a body which has which will actually examine this gentleman or the lady to find out whether he or she is competent enough to get into professional practice only when one gets into the professional practice can he call himself or herself a practicing engineer or a professional engineer so that's very important engineering professionals you have to go through as i said first of all the education part then the training and experience initial training and experience and then the practices so meaning of the substantial equivalence is very important for example let us say some of the universities which are there like the soa university which is one of our most prestigious universities and i'm very glad that professor damodar acharya himself is present here who is the chairman of their most of the international agreements which they are uh, going through and if soa university uh, many of the programs have gone through nba's washington accord and the student has completed in iter let us say in bhubaneswar first two years then the other two years this person or this student can actually undertake in pennsylvania or in california anywhere else so the agency this is jurisdiction of a jurisdiction b one can go from here to there or one can go from here to there etc so that substantial equivalence is very important so graduates from substantial equivalent programs a and b are able to proceed to further professional development then the mutual recognition mutual recognition flows from confidence of the parties in the definition but basically every country which is a member every 3 years 4 years or 5 years the country itself goes through a screening process i must tell you in the iea my own experience was about 4 years back institution of engineers in india they have become members and they said that you are actually a member for the ies uh, what you call uh, the three year evaluation and it so happened uk was going through the evaluation process so a gentleman from japan and myself we are going through the evaluation of uk and we found all their systems are perfect and even then they have to subject themselves to the scrutiny that is extremely important because however large however famous however credited the institution may be but it has to submit itself to the scrutiny this is what the iea says so the the professional competence basically is talking about knowledge skills and attitudes and competence is developed by this is important professional engineers are able to perform functions because of their knowledge skills and attitude but competence is developed by education training and experience <clears throat> so the washington accord which is meant for degree courses either the four year big tech btech degree or be engineering degree or the me engineering which is the integrated they would come through this details are not going through the context is quite important because uh, the professional life cycle you go to the meet standard of engineering education go to the next stage do the training experience then you pass this test and go to become the practitioner but thereafter every year you have to go through a code of conduct and maintain competence how do you maintain competence because you have to actually cpds have to be logged in as a matter of fact some of you would be knowing medical practitioners in california they i know some of my friends who have retired 20 years back but they still want to practice in california so they have to log in so many hours of experience by by uh, 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 training programs which are recognized and those are all logged in proof of that is shown then only you continue to be a practitioner not otherwise this is important both ways we ask a korean company we ask a japanese company we we can even ask a chinese company to come and do a work in bhubaneswar or in kolkata do we know how to assess them we ask an international person to become a consultant here do we know how to assess this individual but there are international bodies which have given actually how to assess them so that's the point so i bring you to another item we know about the objectives of education <clears throat> input is quite important the input is infrastructure faculty student study column how many books you have in the library how many computers whether you have air conditioned rooms or so on and we always say input is great therefore the institution is great 
by no means absolutely by no means we talk of outputs the outputs are performance of students performance of faculty how many papers the faculty have produced these are all good you can measure them in quantitative terms what the international body has taught us the indians over the past 15 years that actually this is not enough output is necessary but that is not complete in itself what is complete is outcome and there is a great difference between output and outcome the outcome has to be connected with the objectives which we have in mind so graduate attributes these you have defined and then you say that uh, your engineer has actually come up to the objectives let me give an example a simple example simple example is analytical ability in a mechanical engineer <clears throat> and uh, thinking ability uh, is in in, an, in a mechanical engineer now these analytical ability or thinking ability originality innovative capability these you cannot examine by simple terms like how many papers i have published where i have published and so on so there are actually other yardsticks which have been developed based on that these have to be assessed all the above items have to be taken together the objectives the input the output and the outcome for that your education system becomes this is perhaps the bgs slide and i apologize because there are too many things here but i will explain in one minute and whatever we understand hopefully we will be understanding something but this is the most important one on the outcome based education we have a vision we have mission but the po is a program education objective that if i have let us say in ma or ma in history so in ma in history i should be able to write down 10 pos or graduate attributes i write what are my pos it is up to him if we have a vice chancellor today present like professor dr kishor basa a highly internationally known professor of history and anthropology if i ask him what are your pos program education objective for ma class in anthropology or history he should be able to write it down so those are the pos on the left hand side then you have program outcomes the program outcomes are in the middle portion but the course outcomes because in the let us say in history or in economics you are teaching 20 subjects or 15 subjects why are you teaching a subject x for a history a, a ma student or why are you teaching thermodynamics to a metallurgist or mechanical engineer once you say it has a connectivity with one of the pos then only that subject is relevant the other one is the relevance of a teacher omkar mahanti is teaching why is it relevant so therefore mapping of a subject mapping of a teacher to a peo is extremely important that's what you see here as a matter of fact the new education policy which has come into existence now in india <clears throat> and i don't know whether arun babu is here he is one of the architects of that but kasturi rangan who wrote it the document is extremely well written like all indian documents like our, our constitution the unfortunate part is how do you execute you can execute that only if you have if you have these diagrams from prime primary level secondary level edu art education medical education engineering education everything defined in this kind of diagram then only and only then can you progress and we say our nep has become <coughs> effective i want to speak a word about sydney accord most of us have not known about it the sydney accord is an agreement among signatories basically for a position which we say below the degree holders but if you go to germany the great german society in engineering terms it has become great because of basically the so called diploma they don't call diploma engineers they call it engineer schule and in the engineer the diploma engineers are actually the university the engineering schule they call it grad eng but those grad eng are practicing people so they have a bit of mathematics they have a bit of also practicing together whereas the, the graduate engineer that we call as btech or mtech degree holders he should be very strong in computational mathematics computational engineering what we call today science based engineering and so on so july 15 the sydney accord had only 10 but today i think there are about 20 sydney accord members india is still not an applicant let alone becoming a member now indian scenario washington accord we got 2014 
and only tier one institutions they can go into the equivalence a large number of institutions therefore outside the fold and these are actually tier 2 so they have to be encouraged and subject themselves to outcome based scrutiny and gradually they have to come up <laughs> so sydney accord india not an applicant yet and the engineering diploma education need careful nurturing based on outcome based approach dublin accord is totally unknown to us india not an applicant yet and i am not sure we had a meeting in bangalore we brought some people from australia we are talking about dublin accord and sydney accord and they actually did not mean any words to tell us we are not sure if india can be qualified to become an applicant so, so this is a very serious situation now on the washington accord for engineering degree education some basic facts so context i have already set <coughs> i do not intend to go through this graduate attributes now the some of them are knowledge oriented some are skill oriented but the problem solving skill group in the problem solving skill group how many of our courses in engineering engineering colleges we do this the question paper the teaching methodology the teachers background they should all be mapped here then only and only then it will come it will not come by a stroke of luck or as a matter of serendipity it cannot so therefore the problem solving skill group the student eventually when he graduates out the graduate attributes are such the problem analysis should come under the problem solving one design development of solutions investigations so this is defined level of problem solving we have to define them skill oriented groups attitude oriented this is extremely important because as an engineer as an engineer in a society first how would you develop an attitude does he know the society around him is he empath you know the empathy he has to build around him for the people in uh, among which he lives the environment and the sustainability and most important is the ethics and lifelong learning that is what is important so attitude skill oriented knowledge base all these are defined in the iea and now in washington accord <clears throat> so these are the graduate attributes for want of time i don't think we can go through this so globalization of the engineering indian scenario washington accord now the national board of accreditation 1994 it was a part of uh, aict i guess uh, immediately uh, after that no 2005 professor damodar acharya himself went as the chairman of aict and i am extremely glad that he is present here because it was with his signature and arjun singh as our minister when india's application went for the washington accord <clears throat> but thereafter the 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 washington accord people they objected because they said nba if it is a part of aict it cannot become an auditing body the body which sets up the engineering colleges and the body that actually audits the colleges performance quality wise they cannot become same which is why nba came into existence as an independent autonomous body with effect from 7th january 2010 10 with the objective of etc etc which i have written down the memorandum of association and rules for nba were amended in april 2013 it's a very important one to make it completely independent of aict administratively as well as financially in order to conform in order to make nba conform with the major ob objectives of nba are all given here basically to assess and accredit the engineering education program at diploma degree and post graduate levels <clears throat> of any i am not going through but the general council executive committee and the academic advisory committee this is very important what the washington accord has defined for india they have said your tier 1 institutions only can apply others cannot even apply and the tier 1 institutions are these i don't have to read that national institutes of national importance national institutes of technology and it's central universities state universities etc etc some of the private universities which have become also under the state law or deemed to be and most important institution declared as autonomous bodies so the nba and washington accord became a provisional member of washington in 2007 that's the time i think when professor acharya was there and then it was given the status of a permanent signatory on 13 june 2014 after nba became a completely independent body administratively and financially but the sad part is the signatory status is subject to the condition that only the programs of 
tier one institutions accredited by nba are eligible and when the the accreditation takes place nba also does the outcome based education because it has to be a part of the the international body which is the washington accord the assessment parameters for the uh, nba today for the tier one is this <clears throat> so uh, you will find here program level criteria institution level criteria and the total is 1000 and award of that when accreditation for an institution takes place tier one institution also takes place for 6 years then it has to be yes for all at least seven and it has to be some kind of uh, reservation in maximum three it should be less than three and worries zero deficiency zero for three years at least four of the criteria should be met and deficiency must be zero and below this is no accreditation i i think in odisha today nit raurkela has all the engineering programs they have been accredited as i have been told so the current indian scenario of higher education we know that it's a very large number of universities large number of degree institutions diploma institutions etc but most important is the tier 1 institutions are only very few tier 2 institutions can improve through accreditation process only and there is a crisis of teachers we don't have to say that the crisis of teachers and i always used to call it a crisis i still remember when marshal kar was a colleague of mine because he was the ncl director i was in nml jamshedpur a director level scientist thereafter he became my boss and uh, professor marshal kar was present uh, when we talked of uh, to infosys uh, a chief that there is a crisis of teachers then uh, dr marshal kar was kind enough to say that dr manthi is using the word crisis because in india unless you use the word crisis nothing gets done but a uh, truly it is crisis i said no something beyond what professor marshal kar has said how would you describe a situation how else would you describe a situation in india when most of our teachers they would not be able to qualify according to the international standard you have a road where there are potholes you say that 20% of the potholes are there on the road but if there are 80% potholes and the balance 20% on the road how do you describe that road so this is the situation of crisis of teachers it needs a process optimization and not a product sir, sorry sir how much time is that sir? two minutes two minutes i think this is the last but one. yes it's only two minutes so process optimization and product inspection this i think all the management people will understand but my the layman i think this is extremely important if i again take a terminology from the number of institutions if you have very large number of institutions then you 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 cannot go for product inspection if you are talking of arcelor mittal let, let us say arcelor mittal which is the largest steel company in the world and 20 different places they produce steel if they produce 110 million tons which is close to what india produces or today possibly 120 one company but in 20 different places how do they do uh, the, their optimization of the processes it cannot become a product inspection every inch of steel cannot be inspected you you cannot do that so the process has to be optimized this is the point and this is where many people differ if we take or talk of iit for example there most of the processes are to an extent optimized even if i don't do the product of uh, inspection that means every student is inspected you still get a certain product which is quality and the other thing i want to say demographic dividend is not given it has to be earned the number is there but you have to go through this process and probably following the international way would help you thank you very much for your patience that's it thank you very much Sir, I unmute Kavya to say. Okay, okay. Okay. Now, now I'm audible. Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay. Thank you, Professor Manthi, for your excellent exposition. I think uh, there will be large number of questions from our uh, distinguished audience here. I'm not able to see from here who is really asking this question because I'm just uh, I don't have that facility here. No, no. So chat please... box should be there with Sudesh Babu if you. Make the chat box available to Professor Acharya. He should be knowing. 
part of that is most of the question professor damodar i i will read out i will to read out नमस्कार सरोज बाबू दोज ऑफ यू नो दो the director general of indian uh, ordnance factories and we used to interact with him from the national metallurgical lab so that is his background so saroj babu if you have any question and defense labs have become common today they they have been disintegrated each defense factory has become an institution today <laughs> i don't know probably uh, well he is not that no, are you able to hear me Are you able yes, to yes, hear yes, me? Yes, 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 yes. Saraj Babu, uh, how are you? Namaskar, first of all. Ah, uh, namaskar. It is good morning in USA and uh, good evening oh, there. Oh, you are in USA. Uh, uh, you are adding so, the international flavor. I'm happy about. Mm. <laughs> you are adding the international flavor. Yes. Ah, uh, that's right. So <laughs> your talk has been uh, so much revealing to me because I retired nearly two decades ago. So I was listening to your talk. It's a very serious talk. and the time was very short so after such a serious talk let me just tell something light okay so that the audience will be able to observe it better you see i also belong to iit kharagpur from where you came and rosacharya so came. came but uh, i will be very uh, what shall i say it will be convenient to me if i just say omkar instead of dr onkar absolutely Mahan, absolutely Sata. please 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 uh, so i will take you back to the year 62 60 1962 63 yes when you were doing your third year btech <laughs> and in <laughs> metallurgy ah uh, metallurgy and i was doing my mtech there and that time there were very few institutions in our country having a course on metallurgy right one was of course college of mining and metallurgy at bsu then indian institute of science bangalore then bengal engineering college shipur and iit was just starting rurki 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 <clears throat> rurki was there but uh, that was not so much well known rurki was very much known for civil engineering correct no, but met metallurgy uh, came there yes. metallurgy was not so much known there so and in that time in uh, metallurgical engineering department of iit kharagpur there were very few phds in fact only dr sarkar was the phd and he had come from university of british columbia and joined there recently yes. professor p r dhar was the head of the department was not having phd degree professor banerjee was not having phd or professor sen was also not having phd and there were many faculty members they were having only masters degree but what i want to say is that they were not having phd degrees but they were professionals of very high order yes that is the distinction which i wanted to make regarding the educational qualification about which you have told so much and the professionalism in fact today's talk was professionals He did not say only engineering, but your talk is mostly on engineering only. But what we lack professionals in every field. In every field. And a, and a few days back in our think tank, there was a very long WhatsApp blog by Mr. General Vikas Mahanti in the field of medicine. How we lack professionals there. and actually there if you come into the discuss you will find position is more alarming compared to the field of engineering anyway i am digressing from the main topic but vikas is here i think vikas are you here vikas is my cousin oh acha ha ye 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 general vikas mohan ji uh, and uh, he he wrote i am not asking asking the question i am only supplementing to what onkar has already said in details 
without slides or without graphs and other, how we lack professionalism in every field. So then IIT Kharagpur in those days was having a system that they will call for the students after 10 years, those who passed out from IIT. After 10 years, they will like to find out where the students have been employed or what they are doing. And they will be called for a talk or for a lecture to tell about what they have really done in 10 years time. And I had to call, I was also once called then I gave a talk that what I have done in the field of defense production, as far as metallurgy was concerned. I remember that after I finished my talk, Professor Dhar was still there as the head of the materials engineering. And he appreciated my talk. And then immediately said, we offer you a post of adjunct professor. That means you will come here, devote some lectures, and then go back and like that, if you can do it, we'll be very happy. I agreed. But then as soon as I came back to metal and steel factory at Isapur, which was the main factory in the defense production, so far as metallurgy was concerned, I was transferred and I could not utilize that opportunity. So the very process of building of professionals was there inculcated into institutions like Indian Science Bangalore, and IIT which are being made out. So that approach was there. And you maybe that is the reason why after you pass out, we take from these institutions, you are straightly accepted in USA. You can go and do your MS there and other even today. But you pass out a MBBS and come to USA to doing your MS or MD and you are not accepted you have to again go through a course, appear in exam and other. So the professionalism <laughs> aspect was being developed, being inculcated in IITs, in industrial science, and also NITs to some extent from the beginning. That is why NIT Raurkala today has been able to confirm to some of the standards. So, and in our think tank, we are looking forward every month for a talk and a lot of planning goes to decide the subject, to decide the speaker. And though most of us have been, have ceased to become professionals after retirement, we still look forward to that. And we feel if we can build up a culture of professionalism, particularly in our state, it will be very, very useful. And the best professionalism I should say, which should be developed is among, among politicians. Politics also should have a professionalism. It's not that politics is a bad profession or anything like that. It should be the most important profession. And here in the USA, I am there for the last four or five months. And I saw that when they approved the first black woman justice. Some of the senators belonging to the Republican group voted in favor and they have not been removed from the Republican party because there is a culture of professionalism in politics in this country. There are one or two questions there. And similarly, uh, I think we have to finish up now. Yes. Uh -huh, yes, only two minutes. Sorry, sorry. I took two, two minutes and I have started speaking about five minutes now. So this culture of professionalism should be among administrators, among politicians, among doctors, and everybody. And if they go through the systems which has been nicely explained, which but to be which, which you could not observe fully by Dr. Mahanti, that is welcome. Thank you very much for giving me two minutes. Uh, sir, there is a question for Mr. Uh, uh, Panigrahi. Please focus some light on the therapy in the Indian context, which must be implemented in the right earnest. Can you repeat it? Uh, Professor Acharya, could you cap capture the question? Please focus some light on the therapy in Indian context, which must uh, be 
Better in writer. Could you please uh, make this one clear? The question is not clear to me. What is that therapy? Get a panic Can you please explain what do you mean by therapy? Yeah. In this case, I think. Engineering therapy? Panacea. Panacea. <laughs> Sir, for every problem, there must be some treatment. Yes, yes. So that is the intention. <laughs> yes. yes. No, so what what you are so what is your question? I think our chairman is asking you, Alok Babu, Alok Babu, Alok Panigrai. Or Joy Kusta Panigrai. Sir, sir, excellently you have uh, presented all sorts of uh, things concerning this uh, uh, technical education. But uh, still then uh, at our state level or uh, at the country level, we are facing so many problems uh, to ensure quality. So that is the uh, key problem, main problem, so far quality is concerned, so that uh, the professionals uh, which are being produced from these institutions, they are up, not up to mark. So what is the problem and uh, how can this be solved? If you remember, I think Mr. Chairman, you can say a few words. My last slide was exactly that. Our educational institutions should subject themselves to the scrutiny part. And they must, in the, if they go through that scrutiny, they would have gone through most of these parameters that we talked about, which will bring in professionalism. This is one part. And the second part is you said that uh, the educational institutions are producing professionals. Now, I want most of our friends to at least take one idea from this talk, that as soon as you graduate out of a college, you do your MSc or you do your BTEC, you are not, I repeat, you are not a professional yet. You have to go through a training program. You have to go through a hands-on experience program to show or demonstrate that you can take independent decision. And in your own profession, you have shown at least some kind of expertise. And then you subject yourself to another scrutiny. And then you become a professional. Sadly, which is that body? Such a body doesn't exist. That body today is institution of engineers is taking upon itself to do that part for the national professionals and some international professionals, which I think is not being done properly. So Dr. Panigrai, that is what is necessary. Out of the educational systems, you come out, even if you are from IIT or NIT, they, the, all the IITs have not gone through. The IITs have not subjected themselves to the, to the Washington Accord or the NBA. Whereas the Stanford's of USA, the MIT's of USA, they have all gone through the ABET system, A-B-E-T. And the ABET system is the protector of Washington Accord in the US. Yes. So all the educational institutions in the US, no matter whether you are a very big name or a very small name, you have to subject yourselves to this kind of scrutiny. So if you, in my view, if you go through this scrutiny, A, the other engineering colleges, they will see that big engineering colleges are now subjecting themselves Unfortunately, the NBA scrutiny is a very costly process today. And that is why many of our colleges are not going through. They are going through a, a cheaper and also easier process, which is the UGC process, which is called the NAC process, NASE. And in the NAC process, the entire institution is dubbed or stamped as ABC. Whereas in the international process, every discipline has to go through a process. There is a big difference between these two. Sir, okay, uh, may, sir, may I add something? Yes, yes. sir. Uh, concluding remark, you can go. Okay, that, that part I agree, but I'll just add something to the question which was raised by Dr. Manigrai that uh, our quality is not good so far as our engineering uh, graduates are concerned. That is a fact that we agree. The reason is to have actually the quality uh, output you should have stu quality student input and also quality teacher input. Right. And also the facilities and the environment should be there. Now, in all these cases, first I, if you come to a teacher, a person actually who is uh, not getting anywhere, he opts to be a teacher. Right. So naturally, you cannot expect best uh, input from him for the students. And any student now, it is easier to get admission 
in an engineering college, then actually getting an admission to a sort of arts college, better arts college, with 35% actually one can read engineering. And you have got large number of such institutions. And who are managing this institution? All these fellows are in the private sector. Not even 10% of the institution in this country in engineering are in the head, heads of the government. Again, in government, if you see that uh, particularly the state-controlled colleges are in really bad shape, and whatever good colleges that you said, we find only in central sector, I, either NIT or I, IIT, <laughs> but central universities, central university, but not actually in the state sector because for the state state people actually this is the, the, the last priority. In fact, it, it is a negative thing for them because in the state level, people think that if somebody is very well educated, actually he will not vote for us. So this is the reality. One more thing, I will just quote a story here, simple story. Once I was traveling from uh, Calcutta to Delhi. By my side, one gentleman was there. And he came to know that I am somehow connected with AICT, just in course of talk. Then he said, I will quote actually whatever he said in Hindi. Dr. Saab, I sunta hu, aajkal engineering college dalne mein kafi fayda hai. Just please then I asked him, you He said, so you can do anything you like. So this is the real situation. The institution the owners, they don't have anything to do with the education. For okay. them, Absolutely. doing with allocation, allocation business or some other business, they're all same thing. Or education business, anything you do. Uh, so this is, this is the thing. So naturally, the quality inputs are not coming. One more thing, what is happening? Uh, Damodar, sir, what is the way forward? Which one? So far, our, our country is concerned, sir. The country in concern, the, the process itself is also showing some way out. Let me tell you, when I was there, we had hardly about uh, little over five lakhs engineering seats throughout the country. Today, it has gone to 16 lakhs. And what is happening? The admission is less than 50% because there is no, not so much a market. And we are producing bad quality product. This is this will not really be sustainable. As a result, the colleges are closing. And today, no student is actually willing to read engineering. So the number will come down. Definitely only good institutions will survive. But this is only a small part of it. Main thing is there is a lot of problem in our education itself, system itself, education itself. For example, when we are actually engineering student, we used to have practical training. And today, practical training is actually, you know, optional. Students really they do not go to, they have not seen the industry. So this type of education will not be in a position to give professional. Now, I will uh, come to, uh, I think uh, two, three things are going to happen. Uh, number of institutions will get closed, less number of people will be really attracted to engineering education. And the one actually who will survive, the institution which will survive, 
they will be definitely of better quality. The society itself actually will do it. Be, the, apart from this, there is no other go. go. But again, said side, uh, the other side of the story is the government is also encouraging such institutions to survive. For example, many of these so-called surviving institutions producing so-called engineers, they thrive on actually the scholars, the admitting students, the namesake of different categories who are entitled to government scholarship. So governments give them scholarship. These, these students, even they don't attend the class. So I'm sorry, just a minute. So, so that, that part, also the politicians have to understand. I know pretty well in Andhra, Tamil Nadu, even in Odisha, large number of institutions are really surviving based on only dole from the government. Otherwise, they should not be there. Now, I will really come to some other things what uh, Professor Ankarmanti has told very clearly regarding the accreditation and the type of uh, the you know, professionals that actually that we should uh, produce. Uh, let me say, say one or two small things. It is true that actually there are various accords, Washington Accord, then your Dublin Accord, Sydney Accord. These accords are there. One of the reasons for having this accord and bringing a sort of parity in the quality of uh, output that we get from different countries has been some of these countries actually they were really depending on the input from other countries. The work workers from other countries or professionals from other countries used to come in them, to them in large number. So therefore there was a mechanism necessary to, have, to ensure the mobility. Mobility was the first uh, thing so that people with certain background, certain qualification, uh, certain quality level, they could really move from one country to other country. That is the basic thing why actually this uh, accord and uh, agreements. Started. Accord and agreements, yes. Uh, pardon? Accords and agreements. Uh, accords and agreement, all these things started. Now, so far as the Washington Accord is concerned, since actually uh, I was involved in some way, way back in 2007, I'll tell you actually in 2007, in spite of everything, they agreed that some, some of the engineers who are coming out from, let us say, uh, in the Indian institutions, particularly in IITs and, and Southern Institution, IIC, they're pretty good. And in fact, they don't, they're much better than even what uh, the, the quality of people which they produce in their own country. But here, one point actually Professor Mahanti has very clearly told that this NBA was not having an independent entity. This was one point. Then we said that, okay, NBA will make, it, make them actually independent. The next question which they said, and that still remains, they said that all your institutions who are there, these institutions are not subjected to accreditation by NBA, like your IITs and NITs. And in a country, you cannot have these two systems. And in fact, the one which they have said that oh, some people are, uh, you know, eligible for the accreditation, like tier one institution, that is IITs, NITs, what they said, still that stigma remains they are not actually allowing all others to enter into this because, and IITs, they also say that we are super, we are better than MIT and other things, but they don't ex ex understand that even in, uh, in USA, every institution worth the name, whether it is Stanford and MIT right, or whatever yes. it is, they are subjected to a bit. A bit. A bit. And every technician is not really that easy. Here in Odisha, only a SOA University got every technician for three branches. 
but it was a very tough exercise. And even in those in, uh, institutions like MIT and uh, you know Stanford, there also people. Who is this fellow? Right? This this uh, they are also quite afraid of this uh, you know Abbott visit. But one thing is there: the secretaryship system is really good there. Because the people who are involved in the accreditation process, they themselves are very high quality people. And they have certain say their ethics and uh, you know dignity. They, they really give it. But here in our system, more instruction that you have, more visit that you have, more corruption really uh, creeps in. This is something in our uh, mentality or the way that we work. That is the reason why even AICT for accreditation is for actually they are uh, giving approval. They said that, okay, voluntarily declare and we will have something like a sudden inspection. So people also manipulated their own things and very few people were caught. They could also escape. This is the situation in our society in every fear of, you know, education and particularly professional education. Now let us also talk about one more thing which I would like to say. Uh, not only that engineering is not the only professional education, but there are others also. For example, you take actually chartered accountants. In USA, we do not have actually this chartered accountants business. Or even uh, uh, some other countries. British, British is actually having that sort of thing, but not many other countries. Because accounting is also a professional uh, course. And what was done here, that through an act, that is uh, this so-called uh, Chartered uh, Accountant ICWA, ICA, what is the thing? Indian Institute of Chartered Accountants, that sort of thing. So it was a society, and they were empowered to give actually the certificate that whether somebody will become a chartered accountant or not. And for that thing, what they did, somebody has to work in a chartered accountant firm under somebody for a number of periods. Two things happened. First of all, these students actually, they were exploited. Only when this senior chartered accountant said that actually he is eligible, then actually he will pass. Apart from giving some of the, you know, uh, sort of uh, normal actually examination. And these chartered accountant professions, what they really did, they deliberately reduced the past percentage, and it was as low as five, seven, ten percent. So many people really suffered. And what has happened now? It is happening. The government is coming out with an act so that this uh, uh, the body, the chartered accountant body, which was giving this sort of thing, this power is given that will be withdrawn, and we will fall very much in similar line to what is happening in USA. Australia and few other countries. So we have all types of things. But main thing is actually good professionals are not coming up because we are not able to blend the formal education in the university side with the practice. Actual practice, unless that thing is done, good professionals cannot come out. Even in engineering also, there are certain things for example, a, for a mining engineer, if he has to really work in the mining thing, he has to get a mining engineering certificate. And without that certification, it will not work. In other places, let us say in USA or Canada, UK, many other places, there is a thing called Certified Professional Engineer, CPE. And these fellows actually, as Professor Manthi has told, 
they undergo training they undergo the peer test they have to periodically at least every 4 5 years they have to they have to go through this thing then only they will be able to give uh, uh, will be actually a cp here also we have something for instance any building if it has to be really evaluated and given actually loan will be given by the things it will be certified by you know certified engineer certified engineer but these certified engineer they don't have anything they are as good as actually just a pass out test and a pass out but they don't have any professional experience because there is no test in it we do not have a system of testing i think it is extremely important that we become more professional and we should follow actually what others are doing otherwise what will what will happen all these things that we are saying that we are great in uh, so far as our technology is concerned everything we have done in the past but when it comes to brass tacks level we are not really that great we must really understand where we stand for example very simple thing when this uh, golden quadrilateral came who have really designed this design came from malaysia design came from usa and in civil engineering we said that we are very great people but then why did this thing happen so many many other things it is but still there are many sectors where we are doing extremely well and where the education and practice is also getting linked uh, i want to add something mr chairman with your permission yes please please uh thank you very much actually all your observations are extremely relevant i'll take only a minute that's one and a half minutes perhaps one i found during my experience of these three years as the chairman of the engineering board of nba it uh -huh. was even the groups which are going for what you would call the inspection of the premises mm -hmm. themselves not properly trained in the nba program itself so if you don't know that <laughs> if i become a big professor i automatically also know about the washing record i i fully agree they do not know even what the nba is evaluating yes yeah, so, so so the evaluation process is one part the second one is i think professor panigrahi asked here dr panigrahi the answer in addition to whatever professor uh, acharya has said i think the the lead has to come from the government government colleges be it general colleges or engineering colleges today the government colleges themselves you have been the chairman also of uh, one or two government uh, institutions here lately in the past so many years igit sarang or somewhere the number of uh, number of teachers in ravensha university the number of teachers in utkal university in the physics department if you look at them it is abysmally low it is much lower than the minimum which is prescribed by the national body so the institutions do not conform to the minimum who else will that's one and secondly if you throw actually the uh, chips then the monkeys will come so that means what that means unless actually the teaching job becomes extremely attractive the bright people cannot come but uh, dr panigrahi i think the good news is we have the sundar pichai from metallurgy department of iit kharagpur we have the arvind krishna who is uh, the ibm chief today we have uh, satya nadella <laughs> chief now the twitter chief so all these people are actually graduates from here but they what we are talking about the system what we talked about is the system so that more such people will come out that's true by exception they are coming but now we want to make more numbers should come and we think that we have youth as uh, our uh, kind of help but demographic dividend cannot happen unless they are educated and as saroj babu said that they they have to be educated properly properly in the sense that uh, they they know what needs to be done in education where else can they know that analytical ability problem solving ability how will it come if my question paper asks me only i have to mug and essentially vomit out and the teacher has to know everything the good thing i wanted to tell you ai city recently has gone through an uh, the artificial intelligence system recently 15 days back and my engineering uh, group we are also part of that now about uh, 13 lakh students they have taken together in that system at least they are able to distribute for practical training 
So there are some efforts which are going on now. It's only recently. And uh, so hopefully something will come out. I agree entirely. How can engineering happen unless they see the shop floor? Unless they see the shop floor, the engineering cannot happen. And that is happening because the teachers themselves do not know what is the shop floor. So this is, this is the crisis of teachers because they, they do not know uh, why they are coming to the teaching profession. And in, in the teaching profession, they will get one-tenth uh, of, of the salary which they get, but they have to write down the full salary X. But in reality, they will get X by 5 or X by 10. So what will you do? Anyway. Yeah, Professor Manthi, just I would like to add, since actually you told about the government, government colleges and IJIT Sarang. Yes. Incidentally, I, I was there in IJIT Sarang. Yes, yes, chairman, yes. But now yes. my the period is over. Yes. Now, let me tell you a few to the my own experience there. It has got actually hundred and more than 120 contractual lecturer. Right. Who get 30,000 rupees a month. And it has got about 60, 70 regular. And out of this regular faculty, the picture here is that the most regular faculty they don't teach or they take up some administrative job. Even government really puts them out and put somewhere else. So right. what type of education will be there? And these institutions, they get by the way. These institutions, by the way, they get very good students. Correct. But, but they get actually very, very low quality of teachers. And to add to this problem, what government has decided that all uh, teachers will now be recruited by the PSC. By, by PSC. So, state PSC. So, now you can think of, is there any uh, place in the whole world where Public Service Commission actually recruits teachers? in different field. Anyway, and to add to that, one more very interesting decision has come that even these uh, couple of uh, autonomous colleges which are there in engineering, who, whosoever will be the chairman of the board, the board chairman will be really selected. Uh, they have to apply through an advertisement and in fact an advertisement has come and somebody else actually will be choosing them. Now, you tell me actually who is the fellow with any little worth will apply for such a position. The fellow, there is nothing. Not he, he doesn't get even one rupee. No facility. Only gets the blame. And for that thing, he will apply. No, very strange. Very and this, strange. Is, this is the thinking in our uh, uh, highest level, so far as the education is concerned. And the same thing is, one more thing. Can you really think of that Education in education, the curriculum and syllabus, even prescribed book, everything will be same. So then, what is, what is actually the scope for innovation? Where is the scope for experimentation? Right. <laughs> okay. Sir, so that's it. So, so now, sir, we can request Professor Mahanti to Professor uh, Mishra to propose the product. Postgraduate Department of Botany of Uttar University has only one HOD, two junior lecturers, no labor, no labor stands, no pions. Correct. How can you ensure quality yeah. education and production? This, this, this situation is same everywhere in, in any Everywhere college. the same situation. In no, Ravensai University, the famous Ravensai University, money. same situation. So far as education is concerned. With, in so referring to... In sir, referring Professor Vinayak Rath is also having a poster, I think. Yes, please. He belongs to... He, if you have a specific PC, question, wants... I think we should take up. Otherwise, it is quite late. Uh, I don't know about others, but I have another meeting coming up. If there is a very specific question, I think we can take up. Vinayak Babu. I think we all accept it with generosity. Unmute. Rath, you want to speak something? If you have a question, please unmute. Vinayak Babu, you have to unmute yourself to be heard. 
we can't hear you don't vinak sir unmute karantu uh, okay uh, okay then let us go I to professor we... misra to propose yes, the thanks okay. i think because it is 7:30 the next okay. meeting comes yes after namaskar uh, namaskar good evening and what to say we are to offer our gratitude to two great speakers a structural functional analysis in fact the problems we face and very good position it is now the work of think tank to think beyond and what more we can do make it a policy make it a objective paper to hand over to the government or all that so a deep sense of gratitude to professor umkarnath mahanti who has been always brilliant i have heard many of his speeches even in my college at pranath autonomous college khurda when he gave the uh, lecture on the golden jubilee lecture there also he had read lot of views and today he took us back to history and it to the present comparing uh, buch khalifa with the collapse of the flyovers so oh, that was really, really tremendous and this resource the data we got today and uh, that is unexcelled and excellent and both the mother babu also added the analysis in so well and the interaction was beautiful i think all this is recorded and it will go to posterity it has to go to the institutions which are making our future technocrats and i wish that think tank carries on this brilliant move uh, thank you participants thank you invitees a uh, deep sense of gratitude and thanks to our speakers umkarnath dr umkarnath mahanti and dr amodar acharya uh, for making it a evening to remember for a long time to come thank you everybody and namaskar as i sign out okay, thank, you, thank, thank you thank you professor mishra professor mishra happens to be vice chairman of ipa also and then i must add one sentence here i must thank everybody i must thank professor mahanti and dr damodar professor mahanti has got some other engagement dr damodar acharya is in kolkata now the in spite of that they have, they have agreed to take up the class here and take up the session here and then i am also grateful to uh, uh, professor vinayak rath uh, for his uh, presence here and he has also requested the uh, professors and the directors of riser to be present here and then really we are amazed to see the response of the engineering fraternity here and i think this is a big start. it uh, i think it gives a quick start rather we can say that the thinking process will start uh, uh, and then we will definitely achieve something in future thank you everybody and thank i you. must thank Good our night. president uh, dhiran kumar rai and vivek patnaik who are there who are not there who are not here now but they have all the things and they have also guided me well and uh, thank you everybody. thank you sir thank you please convey our good wishes to dhiran babu thank you Oscar, Oscar. And...